So, ladies and gentlemen, let me first pick up where, where Hans Rosling ended. I think he made a very important statement saying that it's the local contacts that determines whether innovations will be picked up and have impact. And that's absolutely valid also in the health field. And he also made this mention about the, the rural poor who live in extreme poverty. And, and indeed, this is a problem because they may hardly benefit from product innovation for health as they first need to make that escape from their poverty. But there's a dilemma because it's not only bad roads, poor sanitation and poor nutrition that keeps them trapped, but also poor bad health itself. And that's what I call the vicious cycle of poverty diseases. These diseases are driven by poverty, but at the same time perpetuate that poverty. And the key to getting out of this dilemma is, I think, innovation in healthcare delivery. For the rural poor, healthcare is not accessible because the institutions that should deliver this care are dysfunctional. So we need innovations such as low-tech diagnostics or mass treatment campaigns that can bypass dysfunctional institutions while responding to the local context and disease cycle. And let me make another observation. Urban poverty is on the rise and is changing the face of poverty diseases. By now, more than half of the world's population lives in towns and cities. And over the next two decades, urban populations in Africa and South Asia will double. Many are very poor, living in slums, cities within cities with unhealthy, violent environments and disrupted social systems. This demographic transition is transforming disease patterns as well. Urban lifestyle and environment are pushing up the burden of non-communicable diseases. And infectious diseases remain a problem but change from parasitic and vector-borne diseases such as malaria, often with high mortality in children, to diseases such as HIV and tuberculosis that come with high mortality in adults. TB now is, as we just mentioned, the biggest infectious killer worldwide. The shift to urban poverty also changes what, what innovations are needed and feasible. In slums, healthcare is not absent, but often of poor quality and accessible only if you can pay. Innovations in delivery must therefore address affordability and quality and can build on technologies such as mobile phones and social media. My third observation is that these demographic transitions are increasingly driving health security at global level. The Ebola epidemic in West Africa and the emergence now of the Zika virus epidemic in Latin America are examples of local disease outbreaks that can quickly have global consequences as urban centers across the world are increasingly interconnected. With poor quality care comes misuse of antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance. Tuberculosis is again a case in point. Global surveillance, to which Dutch uh, groups have had major contributions, shows that multi-drug resistant TB is a problem of middle-income countries. They're rich enough to have drugs, but too poor to deliver them properly. The emerging data suggests this is true for other antimicrobial resistance as well. In TB, the biggest drug resistance problem is in fact in Eastern Europe, on our very doorstep. So AMR and other epidemic threats don't just happen far away. For health, the north-south paradigm is no longer valid. These problems are interconnected and truly global and require innovations that have global impact. So what are the solutions? It all coalesces around vision and leadership. Vision and leadership in science and innovation, in industry, in the health sector and those organizations, organizations that support it, but above all in politics. Then what should that leadership bring? First, we need research into better products for poverty diseases. We need effective vaccines, drugs and diagnostics for which we must stimulate basic research and product development. This requires political leadership, but also a willingness of researchers and research funders to create and follow research agendas that lead to innovations that really matter. Second, we need to overcome market failures. Diseases of poverty are by definition faced with market failures in product development and in delivery. Big Pharma is pulling out of antimicrobials, which is felt hardest in poverty diseases. Service delivery is often dysfunctional, leading to poor access for patients to drugs or diagnostics, or innovative products are being underutilized, as we also see in TB. We need vision and leadership to create new models for engaging manufacturers, to maximize access to innovative products, and to improve our understanding of local context and overcome failures in delivery. Finally, we need vision and leadership to get us out of our silos. 
Ownership of global health innovation is moved around between sectors like a hot potato. The science and education sector perceives health issues as a field to be addressed by the health sector. The health sector regards poverty diseases as outside their realm, so refers to international development. International development may see health as within their scope, but for innovation points to science or economic affairs. And economic affairs has little interest because there is little market potential. This siloed approach is visible in our country as well as at EU level. We need vision and leadership to take ownership of global health and poverty diseases in a holistic approach. Our Minister of Health, Edith Schippers, together with Martijn van Dam at Agriculture and Economic Affairs, is giving a good example by clearly taking the lead in addressing antimicrobial anti resistance across these silos here in Europe. Finally, vision and leadership that draws together all relevant sectors can translate into global impact. There is a great example from recent history to which we in the Netherlands have contributed. Only 15 years ago, few people believed it would be possible to provide antiretroviral treatment to poor AIDS patients at scale. Then came vision and leadership in science, such as by the late Hugh Lange, overcoming market failures, such as through negotiated pricing for drugs and for large-scale delivery and impact, the creation, with a lot of support from the Netherlands, of the Global Fund. And above all, decisive global political ownership to tackle the problem. Such a multifaceted approach seeking synergy and coordination between all actors, to me, is the example to follow for antimicrobial resistance, tuberculosis and other global health crises. Thank you. First, Reina Staat. A, a brief response, not more than one minute, on Frank Kobelens. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Frank. Uh, I think you pictured very well the challenges we have uh, ahead. And my first reaction is, yes, we need to uh, look at the context, the local specific context, and we need to be as creative as possible and to connect between those silos you mentioned. But I would add some other silos. We also have uh, non-governmental organizations playing their role, and we need to connect with them. And we do have also private sector. So, if we connect the best of them, then I think innovations can come to scale and have impact on the poor population of the world. That's very brief. Thank you very much, Reina. Halleke. I think I am very optimistic already with what is in place. And if you look at uh, the, the presentation of Hans, you see that there is already tremendous impact of, for instance, application of vaccines. And, and you, you can measure indeed what the impact has been on child survival and the reduction of children born per woman. And I think that that is largely due to improved health, due to vaccination, and where we now see that mass vaccination works, child mortality has been reduced, smallpox has been eradicated, and the problems that we are facing, I think we can apply novel technologies and work through public-private partnerships that are already in place for, for instance, polio, mm -hmm. where um, novel technologies are being applied to bring an uh, affordable polio vaccine with support from, uh, uh, for instance, the Gates Foundation to make it happen. So, so I think it's a, it's a very good list of uh, the problems that are still there, but I would argue that all problems are still as big, and I think we are for a lot of it already halfway, maybe even at 75% of the solution. Okay, thank you very much. Walter. Yeah, and, and you know, Frank, uh, listening to you, um, there's so much that resonates. And it sounds perhaps a bit odd uh, from industry and business to say that the Sustainable Development Goals offer an opportunity for us to make a contribution, to chip in. But we believe, at least in Philips, that we, have a, we made a promise to impacting 3 billion lives on the planet by 2025 each year through meaningful innovation. And so when the SDGs came at us, we committed early on to free seven and 12, and free being about uh, access to healthcare at all ages. And we understand that, to your point, that it takes radical transformation for, to create equitable access in low, and I still call middle income countries. Um, so we focused on community health solutions, involving the community, primary health system strengthening, an end-to-end -end solution rather than an inch wide and a mile deep, because ultimately, uh, and Professor Rosling spent three months in Liberia, that's when we met right after there, proving the point of data-driven 
decision making that can only uh, um, have an impact once you do that across the whole system. So maybe we can talk about some of those learnings uh, later on. I think you will, for sure. Thank you. Um, perhaps to start with you, Hanneke. Um, Frank, Frank was talking about uh, vaccine, vaccines against TB. You're working on a completely new vaccine that will change the world, I think. I really don't know whether they know what you are working on. Perhaps you can tell them, what kind of vaccine are you working on? Uh, what are you going to achieve with that? Yes, so we are currently not working on a TB vaccine. No. I'm sorry. Um, but we are working on very innovative vaccines, uh, for instance, in the field of HIV, where we uh, are working in a public-private partnership with the National Institute of Health, so US government, looking for partnership with the Gates Foundation, working with IAVI, and uh, we there apply our uh, very novel technology to get uh, excellent immune responses in humans that may potentially protect people from HIV infection. Now, people will say, is that uh, a program that you are doing because you uh, are very concerned about the situation in Africa or developing or low-income countries? Of course we are, but specifically for this vaccine, we, we think that if it's uh, protective enough that it can be used worldwide and yeah. then yeah so it's it's then for a pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. not a difficult choice to work on that mm -hmm. but of course there's also other vaccines that only have uh, application in low middle income countries or therapeutics and there also Janssen takes its responsibility like like Philips yeah. is doing with the glo global public health initiative okay, but before you carry on on working together with this one that yeah. one I think this is Awesome that you're working on the HIV vaccine. Who knew? Hey, first, day, when will it be on the market? <laughs> Probably. Well, let me be realistic. So currently we are testing it in humans uh, around the world to see yeah. what the vaccine can elicit, what type of uh, immune response. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, end of next year or beginning of 2018, we will start to test whether it actually works, whether mm -hmm. it can protect people from HIV infection. That, of course, also takes a couple of years. So we expect 2022, 2023 to know whether we can bring it to the market as a product. So eight years from now, more or less. Who of you knew that here in the Netherlands, this lady is working on a vaccine that will change the world? Who knew? Ah, only a few. See, this is a novelty. That's awesome. An HIV vaccine. I remember very well, 15, 20 years ago, people said there will never be a vaccine against HIV AIDS. And you are producing that one. Um, but Hanneke. Oh. Yeah, so we are trying, right? You're trying. And, but that is already quite something. I agree. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I think you're confident that you will succeed, isn't it? Well, I, I think we have reason to believe that it may work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but of course, the, 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 the proof is in the pudding. We will need to demonstrate that it truly works in human beings yeah. and with a high enough efficacy. Because look at, for instance, what happened with the malaria vaccine. That was also very promising and now they need to demonstrate for five more years that it indeed has some efficacy because mm -hmm. it was not as good as it looked in mm -hmm. the beginning. So let's manage expectations. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, thank you. Well, now, Imagine the vaccine will be on the market within eight years. Will it be evident that the vaccine will reach millions of people across the world who are on the brink of getting uh, uh, infected? What do you think? It, it will be something new because uh, current, most, current vaccine campaigns are mo mostly targeting young infants mm -hmm. and they are in a system already. So if you add a vaccine, then they then they can add it to the routine mm -hmm. visits that are already in place, if, if, if you're lucky. Here we will be aiming for adolescents or very young adults, which is a new group that you need to bring in. But I think that if we have a highly efficacious vaccine, and if by that time the population has been prepared for a vaccine that, that, that prevents against a sexually transmitted disease, and let's be honest, if we see what the uptake of the HPV vaccine has been, where, which was also marketed as uh, a vaccine against a sexually transmitted mm -hmm. disease. Parents were in denial. Their kids were never going to have sex, right? That's yeah. what, what people say. So also for an HIV vaccine, that may be a potential hurdle. On the other hand, we see that if you have good interactions with local societies and 
if you prepare uh, the people for this and you see already growing uh, awareness of, mm -hmm. of the disease uh, and, 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 and the risks, then I think that maybe eight years from now, from now the, the, the world may be ready to take it up. And yeah. of course, that is not just the company, right? That, that will again be, I know you don't like me saying it, but in collaboration and in, in partnerships with... Uh, Although I like groups. you to say that, but first I want to raise some attention that you're telling an awesome story that perhaps will be an HIV uh, vaccine. Um, but still, uh, innovation and then a very concrete hurdle, that perhaps young people won't take the vaccine because of a taboo. That's in short, I think, in brief. Walter. Yeah. Philips. Mm -hmm. First of all, some people, I think mainly old pe people, elderly people working at an NGO, say, how is this guy from Philips, a multinational, making a lot of money, talking like a development worker about uh, global health? W what is it? Is Philips changing into an NGO? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I think, as I said before, the, we've early on recognized that the sustainable development goals and the adoption offered opportunities for all. Mm -hmm. And yes, I believe in multi-stakeholders, multi-partnerships, uh, that uh, as much as anyone else does. So it, it opened an opportunity for us to become a partner mm -hmm. to building indeed a better world. And it, you're right, we had to learn the language of the NGOs and our partners. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a long strategic history with Red Cross and UNICEF, but we formalized it in new strategic partnerships uh, about a year and a half ago. And, and we're still in the process of learning each other's language, okay. which is part of becoming yeah. you know, a better partner. Yeah. So, no, no, we're not becoming an NGO. I uh -huh. think we're bringing something else to the table. Okay. Is our local for local innovation capabilities, is our ability to transfer ideas to scalable business models, mm -hmm. uh, to provide access to other partners like private equity. Okay. Because but let's make it very practical. Before the people entered uh, here, the venue, we talked a bit. And yeah. you told me about a kind of a health line. Yeah. I think it was in Kenya or some yeah. low-income countries. Um, you talked about community development workers, uh, local hospitals, big hospitals. Well, can you elaborate a bit on that concrete innovation yeah. where you work together with people, perhaps in the bush somewhere in East Kenya? Yeah, so I already mentioned the fact that it started with an understanding that it requires complete local for local innovation. And this is not just technology. You can't go in there and just drop a piece of technology and say, now your health or your life will be better. Uh, we clearly identify that it requires innovation end to end. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it includes innovation of this health delivery model. Mm -hmm. It includes the innovation of the financing, sustainable financing mm -hmm. models around that. Um, and but, again, but, that but takes... tell me what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, so <laughs> now we have developed solutions that yeah. serve communities that are really remote, as Hans mm -hmm. Rosling said, that are probably in the most underserved areas, yeah. where community health workers go out with a solar-powered backpack to do some basic diagnostics on pregnant women. Mm -hmm. And those are areas in Kenya where the, the child mortality rates are still at the level of 200 mm -hmm. per thousand children born. Mm -hmm. So we're sending them out, and they're triaging the most at-risk pregnancies. And those mothers that are at risk are being brought into a primary health clinic that has some more advanced basic facilities mm -hmm. that are connected to a secondary tertiary clinic. Okay. So as a result, we're structuring the process uh -huh. of pregnant women and reducing the risk of mother and child mortality rates in those areas. Uh -huh. But suppose this line of healthcare was invented by an NGO. I, I think it's well known that, like we look in our own cities, we have a primary physician here. You go to your primary physician, he sends you to hospital as a gatekeeper. Yeah. In many of these areas, there are no gatekeepers. Yes. There's nothing. Yeah. No, you didn't get me, I think, but you told me again before the people yeah. entered the audience that it was Philips who thought about yeah. this whole line. Yeah. And that's because, what I want to hear, of take, course. We take yeah. ideas from elsewhere and try and make them locally relevant. That's and that's right. why we set up an innovation hub in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, staffed by local entrepreneurs and innovators, yes. and that is unlocking innovation capability where it matters most yeah. to the population where you can make most of the impact. That's right. Thank you. Reina, talking about ODA, DA, Development Aid, as yeah. it, it's called, um, I think there are a lot of concerns in the Netherlands because the budget of development assistance went down 
from 0 0.8 or 0 0.7 to 0, 0 0.5 or 6, something like that. Um, a huge part of the budget goes to uh, sheltering refugees. Uh, there is a part, the Good Growth Fund is for companies who are going to invest. Then Hans Rosling is talking about vaccines, education, basic care. How much money, or what is the percentage eventually of the budget from the Netherlands going into this basic yeah. basics? Um, I think, yeah, in a way it's true, we, uh, the entire envelope of official development assistance went down. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it also rose again uh, due to the situation of the refugees uh, influx. Mm -hmm. So we are back on 0.75. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, of that 25% is now dedicated to the refugees who need support in the Netherlands during their first year of stay. That's reality. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are not trying to invest the money that remains in the most clever way that our official development assistance also can leverage other monies and other uh, support innovations like Philips is telling or you are telling. We, for instance, support also through the product um, development uh, partnerships together with uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, NGOs and uh, private enterprises mm -hmm. to invest in those um, products because we really believe if not from public money mm -hmm. also a part of it is invested it's more difficult to leverage private money for that there we find we do have an obligation mm -hmm. And of course, we do support uh, health systems in uh, countries like Mozambique, but also there we try to look at innovations to really reach those at the bottom end and those at the most remote areas through innovation uh, delivery systems, mm -hmm. like introducing through, uh, I would say, enough the financing mechanisms, uh, vouchers so that poor women can buy through that voucher, they are not paying, but by having the voucher, go to a local business person and get their, for instance, bed net to mm -hmm. protect themselves mm -hmm. uh, to mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So these are also ways that you try to, with the amount of money, the public money, because we do need also public systems, mm -hmm. because the system that is possible in Kenya through innovation also is possible because the Ministry of Health in Kenya sets the norms and standards mm -hmm. and ideally would also do the quality control. Mm -hmm. So you need public sector and then you can also build on that and innovate. So that's how we try to make the best of our euro and try to leverage money with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ODA these days is not straight ahead, 100% funding of healthcare, whatever, but it's really as a leverage to work together with these kind of partners. That's what we try. All right. How do, uh, for me, how does it work? When Philips um, is inventing that, that helpline in Kenya, for instance, is the, 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 the CEO of Philips directly uh, communicating with Minister Plumer, for instance? I said, please, at times, can we work yes. together? <laughs> yeah, yeah sometimes, like yes. That? But of course, uh, that's at, at that level. But of course, also in the field, you see yeah. what roles each of us could and should play. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's what you were referring to, trying to have less silos and really look across our own borders that we have set as public sector or private sector that we didn't understand each other. Our mm -hmm. own language was so yeah. different that you already referred to. And also the reservations we had because you already mentioned it, perception that private sector is just only for profit uh, and public sector is just, yeah, perhaps sometimes wasting money, throwing mm -hmm. money at not so efficient systems. So I think these perceptions, mm -hmm. um, we have to really check on each other and say, hey, listen, instead of uh, continuing to discuss what differs us, yeah. let's try to have this common goal. And now with the sustainable development goals in which the world agreed, this is our global agenda up to 2030, yeah. we do need multi-stakeholder partnerships okay. because each in its own role cannot achieve what we need to achieve as worlds together. So yeah. we need to seek how to collaborate. And that's what we are experimenting. Okay, I think you want to... Yeah, so quick response. Uh, yeah. Because we, 
significantly overestimate the impact official of official development assistance, yeah. which is only becoming a smaller portion of what is needed in total. Mm -hmm. The world needs, what, three trillion uh, to develop, you know, to support the sustainable development goals. We are not even close to making that happen. It requires different solutions. And ODA, by and large, should be used as, for example, as assuming the first risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you manage the first risk in any financial transaction, more financial you know, risk takers will come in, including yeah. banks, including uh, private equity. So, so at, at WEF, we spoke openly about, last week, about our partnership with Abraj, mm -hmm. where the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation invested in a health fund, we invested in a health fund, as well as uh, the World Bank. Mm -hmm. That creates a powerful one billion fund mm -hmm. to invest in developing healthcare systems at the bottom end of the pyramid yeah. uh, across 10 different countries. So okay. we're looking at different structures of making the money available. And yes, be honest, as businesses and as private equity, we're in it for the long run to ultimately make money because we believe that that creates sustainability in the system. Okay, but still, oh, first, now, first one remark from, from, from uh, answer from Hanneke. Hanneke, when you want to find, when you have to find money for, let's say, uh, medicine against Ebola, thing, we were working on that too, wasn't it, last year. Where do you find the money? Do you go to Mrs. Plumer or eventually to... No, we, ne we needed more money than that. Than that, <laughs> yeah, yes. where do you go to? Um, so, fortunately, we also have European funds, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, IMI has been a very uh, a generous uh, funder. Mm -hmm. And the system then is that the, the company, or, the, or the, 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 the private company, right, Jensen, makes, uh, has had put money in uh, the game as well. But also, of course, we take the opportunity cost. So you decide then to delay other programs and to fully focus on a program that is indeed not leading us to a commercial interesting target, okay. but where we take our corporate responsibility to yeah. do something that is needed at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and of course you need then the risk taking is, is very well put. Th that needs to be shared because mm -hmm. we don't know if we will be successful and we put in a lot of resources to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But of course then it's very welcome that there is uh, other uh, funders that share the risk. And with our Ebola vaccine, I think what, what happened there is we really put, uh, I think, 70-80% of all our resources in for almost a full year to bring the vaccine as far as possible okay. to use it when it would have been needed. Fortunately, uh, unfortunately for the vaccine development, but fortunately for the region, the epidemic got under control. Yeah, yeah. so for now you, you couldn't use the vaccine because there's nobody to test it on. That's, that's, that's exactly that's right. right. Yeah. Uh, fortunately for them, unfortunately for you, or for developing the vaccine further. Okay, just one last question. Hans Rosling pointed at, he had that, that, that graph there, and it showed that the, the most poor, the less rich people, the most poor people, had just a very, very small share of ODA, of, ODA, of development assistance. Is it possible to overcome that problem by collaborating like you are doing, that the poorest of the poor will be targeted properly in the coming years? Who? Um, yeah, I think first of all we agreed also in 2015 collectively, um, as, at least as EU, that we want to increase our investment in the poorest countries, because mm -hmm. I do think there is a need there. Um, but also, um, uh, like if we invest in a product development partnership, it's not counted as invested in the poorest country, mm -hmm. because we are investing in uh, development of uh, diagnostics or a uh, new vaccine, like Ayavi or whatever, mm -hmm. and then it's not counted as uh, yeah, yeah. investing in the poorest. So sometimes there is that delay as well. So okay. that's, you always can... Uh, cheat with numbers, but that's of course difficult to show. But I do think, yes, we need to uh, to combine efforts mm -hmm. to make sure that the poorest are reached. And that's not the easiest bit, because as also Hans Rosling showed very well, we have come from very far, and we are stuck with the, those ro most remote and most difficult to reach. So that we need to do our business differently and th rethink how we can use different ways of delivery, of innovations, using new techn technologies like mobile phones, uh, this smarter thinking, uh, 
uh, pick the brains from young people who have innovation, innovative thinking, I think that combining those issues, then we really can make the difference and um, not look at what um, separates us, but look at what uh, we have in common. I think it's obvious that you are doing this already. Thank you very much. Please stand here for a few minutes because Frank Kobelens is going to comment on what is said. Frank, I think it's the best that you use your own microphone here. So, so let me yeah. first say that this, this panel is radiating with optimism, um, in not only in terms of what is achievable technically, which, which I think is great because we hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, for example, with the HIV vaccine, even though I heard it's not a promise, at least it's, and you try to manage expectations. I think the very, the mere fact that actually industry, and I see you both as, as industry representatives, actually steps in to say, yes, we have a role to fulfill here and we're willing to take on this role as long as particular uh, conditions are met. I think that's great. Um, I, I think if you look at from the, if, if I take again the perspective of market failure, there's a dear colleague of mine who tends to say, well, it's about two things that are basically two sides of the brain. So it's the one side of the brain is, is the product and the other side of the brain is delivery. And there's no way you can get the product to, to make any impact if you, don't, if you don't have the delivery right. And on the other hand, it also means that you have to think up front about what the delivery uh, site is before you could actually develop, uh, uh, design and develop and, and bring to market that product. And I think the, pre the, the, uh, the, uh, the panel has been very clear about that and I, I, I very much like also the, the way you phrased it uh, for, the, for, for, the, uh, for Philips, saying that we look for end-to-end -end solutions which basically involves this entire chain. So it is not, so it is actually from this end to that end if you will. So I think that's great. Um, so, so the, the other thing that I think is, is, is very interesting that with regard to delivery, there was a lot of uh, interest in the issue of, of financing mechanisms. You mentioned uh, the vouchers like in Mozambique and I think there were several other financing mechanisms. I think when I refer to uh, healthcare in slums not being, ex not being absent, I think there is a lot of healthcare that's private, that is unregulated, but, but where I think that financial mechanism actually sort of tap into their own business model could actually work. So I think that's another area to work in. There was a lot of, in, uh, a, a lot of discussion, and I think rightly so, about ways to uh, basically to assume or share risk for product development. And I think that's very important. I think the PDPs are an excellent example of something that, that works. And I think the Netherlands has done great in being a, a continuous contributor to those PDPs, and I think a number of other mechanisms have been mentioned as well. And then finally, because you, I see you coming at me, uh, <laughs> and, fi and I'm notorious already here, and, and, and finally, I, I think that, that with regard to the silos, I think you're very, you, you're very right that NGOs and, and private sector, in terms of private healthcare delivery sector, should be part and parcel of that. Frank Kubelens, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Reine Beuze. Hanneke Schuitenmaker, Walter Verkeuyen.